Chapter 5 of The Seventh Most Important Thing by Shelley Pearsall. If it had been up to the judge, he would have thrown the book at Arthur T. Owens. He didn't believe a word of the boy's story. So I think seeing him wearing my dad's hat was what made me, you know, do what I did, Arthur said, finishing his stumbling explanation. Right. The judge didn't buy it. In his opinion, the boy was just using his father's death, death as an excuse for causing trouble. All you had to do was look at the facts in the kid's paperwork. Arthur had a father who'd dropped out of school, who'd been in jail a couple of times for minor crimes, and who'd died drunk. What were the chances his son would turn out any different? He was already heading down the same path. In my experience, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, the judge said to Arthur. But James Hampton didn't see it that way. After Arthur and the judge finished talking, Mr. Hampton stood up and asked the bailiff if he could have a quick word with the judge. The bailiff asked if it, would, if it could wait, and James Hampton said as politely as an army soldier, No, sir, with all due respect, it can't. Arthur was still having a hard time believing the junk man and James Hampton were the same person. He kept wondering if it was some kind of trick, if maybe the guy was an actor or something. The two men, James Hampton and the judge, stepped out of the room, and the quick word stretched into an hour. The courtroom was dismissed for lunch. Although he wasn't the least bit hungry, Arthur sat in the courthouse hallway with his mother and ate the bologna and cheese sandwich she had brought for him. It tasted like bologna-flavored cardboard, but he didn't want his mom to start crying again if he turned it down. She looked like she'd been crying for a year. Usually his mom's makeup was perfect and her dark hair never changed. It was always styled with the same big, glossy waves held in place with the same white velvet headband. But now her face was puffy and splotched with red. She kept twisting a pink tissue in her fingers until it fell into shreds on the black dress she was wearing. Pretty soon, she looked as if she was covered in melting pink snowflakes. Arthur wasn't sure why his mother had worn her funeral dress to court that day. Was she already expecting the worst? He'd had to wear his funeral suit because it was the only suit he owned. I'm sorry, Mom, Arthur said for the thousandth time. He'd said it every day she'd come to visit him in juvie. He'd put it at the bottom of every letter he'd written to her. He'd repeated it that morning when she'd brought the suit for him to wear. You should have let me know something was wrong, his mother replied for the thousandth time. Your sister lost a tooth and got an A in reading this week. Did I tell you that already? She asked, her eyes spilling over with tears again. Sometimes when Martha's mom was upset, she didn't make much sense. No, you didn't, Arthur replied, even though she had already told him twice. Do you think they'll ever let you come home again? Arthur sighed. I don't know, Mom. But he didn't think the chances were very good. When court resumed after lunch, Arthur was called to the front. He figured he was doomed when the judge said, This is a highly unconventional sentence, young man, before he had reached the judge's bench. Earlier that day, Arthur had seen kids who had stolen a few lousy bags of chips and candy get sent back to juvie for 60 days or more by Judge Warner. Everybody said he was one of the toughest judges around. So Arthur knew something unconventional had to be pretty bad. In other words, the judge continued sternly, glaring at Arthur, it is not the punishment I would have chosen for you. It wasn't hard to imagine the various punishments the judge might have chosen. Arthur had already pictured all of them. The judge glanced toward the junk man, who had returned to his seat in the third row and was sitting with his hands folded in his laps, in his lap. However, Mr. Hampton has made it clear to me that he is not interested in retribution, but in redemption. He looked at Arthur. Do you know what redemption means? Arthur thought it might have something to do with church, but he was pretty sure the judge wasn't allowed to sentence people to go to church. He shook his head. Well, you ought to know. Look it up later. Redemption. The judge gestured impatiently at the courtroom. I don't have time to be everybody's school teacher. As you can see, he continued, pointing toward the junk man, you have left Mr. Hampton unable to do his work as a result of his injuries, so he has offered an unusual proposal for me to consider. The judge fixed his gaze on Arthur. Instead of sentencing you to the juvenile detention home for an exceedingly long time, which I won't hesitate to do if I ever see you in my courtroom again, Mr. Hampton has requested that you be assigned to work for him until his arm has healed. The courtroom behind Arthur buzzed with confusion. What had the judge just said? The brick-throwing kid was being sentenced to work for the guy he'd tried to kill? Had Judge Warner completely lost his mind? 
Arthur stared at the judge as confused and startled as everyone else. Work for the junk man? What could the judge possibly be thinking? In spite of himself, Arthur spoke up. He made sure to use the junk man's real name, although it still seemed strangely unreal to him. What sort of work does Mr. Hampton do, sir? The judge arched his eyebrows. You don't know? I'm not sure, Arthur mumbled. He couldn't imagine any judge would knowingly sentence a kid to dig through people's garbage looking for wine bottles and busted up furniture. Did the old man have another job nobody knew about? The judge smiled in a rather smug way. Well, I guess you'll soon find out, won't you, Mr. Owens? And with that, Arthur Owens was allowed to go home.